The name of this course is Instructional Phonetics and Phonology. This is session one. We will talk about articulation and acoustics. I'm Mohsen Reza Zadeh. I'm a lecturer at the University of Isfahan. Uh, you can contact me via my email address. Today we will talk about speech production. We will answer this question. What happens to air stream when we talk? We will also talk about different components of speech mechanism. Afterwards, we will talk about sound waves. What do we hear? And I will introduce spectrogram. Later, we will talk about principal parts of vocal track. Speech production. Phonetics is about describing speech. So why are we studying phonetics? There are many different reasons for wanting to do this, which means that there are many kinds of phoneticians. Some are interested in the different sounds that occur in languages. Some are more concerned with uh, pathological speech. Others are trying to help people speak a particular form of English. Still, others are looking for ways to make computers talk more intelligibly or to get computers to recognize speech. For all these purposes, phoneticians need to find out what people are doing when they are talking and how the sounds of speech can be described. So, what is speech production? Most sounds are the result of movements of the tongue and the lips, just like the movements of our hands. We can convey information by gestures of our hands that people can see. The gestures of the tongue and lips are made audible so that they can be heard and recognized just like the way you move your hands and you contact others, you move your lips and your tongue and then you can make sounds and in fact you can speak. So what happens to air stream when we talk? In fact, when we talk, air from the lungs goes up the windpipe or trachea and into the larynx or voice box. In fact, making speech gestures audible involves pushing air out of the lungs while producing a noise in throat or mouth. These basic noises are then changed by the actions of the tongue and lips. But prior to that, when the air is in the larynx or voice box, at this point, the air must pass between two small muscular folds called the vocal folds. If the vocal folds are apart, the air will have free passage into the mouth. For example, when you want to make sounds like f or s, here the vocal folds are apart and the passage of the air is free. But if the vocal folds are adjusted so that there is a kind of narrow passage of air, then the air from the lungs will set them vibrating. Like, for example, v or z or r. These are um, the sounds that cause vibration.
In this picture, you can see the lungs and then trachea or the windpipe. Above that, we have larynx. We also have soft palate and the tongue. We will talk about them later. But here, uh, focus on the part larynx. As I said, in the larynx, we have the vocal folds or vocal cords. This is the picture of uh, an open vocal cord, and this one is closed vocal cord. As I said, if the vocal folds are apart, as uh, yours probably are right now while you are breathing in and out, you are listening to me and you are breathing with your mouth shut. Right now, your vocal folds are apart. The air from the lungs will have a relatively free passage into the pharynx and then to the mouth. Sounds like s, sh, f. These are the sounds that you can make while the vocal cords are open. But if the vocal folds are adjusted so that there is only a narrow passage between them, the airstream from the lungs will set them vibrating, like the examples I gave you before, v or z. Even you, if you um, uh, put your hand on your neck and try saying v. S, v, s. You can see that for v, you feel the vibration around your neck. And when you pronounce, for example, sh, s, f, you do not feel any kind of vibration. Sounds produced when the vocal folds are vibrating are called voiced. When the vocal folds are closed, as you saw in the picture. These sounds are called voiced. Sounds produced when the vocal folds are apart are called voiceless. When the vocal folds are open, these sounds are called voiceless. In order to hear the difference between a voiced and a voiceless sound, try saying a long v sound, which uh, we will symbolize as v. Now compare it with a long f. Now try to um, say them alternatively, like this. You can see that. Once we have vibration and then we don't have it. As I said, if you touch your neck just right in front of your throat, you can understand that we have vibration for v, but we don't have vibration for f. So here, because we have vibration, it is called voiced. And because we don't have vibration for f, it is called voiceless. Now, you can differentiate voiced and voiceless sounds here, for example, for fat and vat, or thigh and thy, for sue and zoo. For all of these pairs, the second word contains a voiced sound and the first word contains a voiceless sound. The air passages above the larynx are known as vocal tract. Vocal tract is divided into oral tract within the mouth and nasal tract within the nose. This uh, picture shows their location within the head. Actually, uh, this is Peter Latfi's head in the photograph. The shape of the vocal tract is very important factor. 
in the production of speech. Uh, pay attention that the air passages that make up the vocal tract may be divided into the oral tract within the mouth and pharynx and the nasal tract within the nose. When the flap at the back of the mouth is lowered, as it is probably is for you right now because you are breathing with your mouth shut, this flap is um, in fact lowered. Right now, air goes in and out through the nose. Right now, you are breathing with your nose if your mouth is shut. So, here, see, speech sounds such as, for example, mm and m, mm, m and n, m mm and n mm, are produced when the vocal folds vibrating and air going out through the nose. Think about the sounds that you can make with your mouth shut. I just gave you two examples, m mm and m. Mm. The upper limit of the nasal tract has been marked with a dotted line here. Look at the picture, you see the dotted lines. Um, the reason is that the exact boundaries of the air passages within the nose depend on soft tissues of variable size. The size is different in different people. This picture shows the four main components of the speech mechanism, the airstream process, the phonation process, oronasal process, and finally the articulatory process. The airstream process includes all the ways of pushing air out, and as we will see later, of sucking it in that provide the power for speech. The airstream process um, is just like a pump. For the moment, we have considered just the respiratory system, the lungs pushing out air as the prime mover in this process. The phonation process is um, the name given to the actions of the vocal folds, only two possibilities have been mentioned. If you remember, we talked about voiced sounds in which the vocal folds are vibrating and voiceless sounds in which they are apart. The possibility of the air stream going out through the mouth as in V or Z or the nose as in M and M N is determined by the oronasal process, the movements of the tongue and lips interacting with the roof of the mouth and the pharynx are part of the articulatory process. So, if we want to summarize four main components of speech production, we can say that the first one is airstream process, pushing air out of the lungs that provides the power of speech. So, the key word here is power of speech. It is made by airstream process. Next is phonation process, actions of the vocal folds, voiced and voiceless sounds, remember? Then is oronasal process, whether the air goes through the mouth or nose, the decision when you want to, for example, make a sound like hmm and n or a sound like v and z. The decision is made here, oronasal process. The air goes through the nose or through the mouth. Here is the switch. And then we have articulatory process, interaction of the tongue 
and lips with the roof of the mouth and the pharynx. So far, uh, we have been describing speech sounds by stating how they are made. But it is possible to describe them in terms of what we can hear. The way in which we hear a sound depends on its acoustic structure. So instead of describing speech sounds, by stating how they are made, we can describe them in terms of what we hear or how we hear the sounds. Speech sounds, like other sounds, can differ from one another in three ways. They can be the same or different in pitch, loudness, and quality. Therefore, two vowel sounds may have exactly the same pitch in the sense that they are said on the same note on the musical scale and they may have the same loudness, yet still they may differ in that one might be the vowel in bad and the other might be the vowel in but. So here the pitch is the same, the loudness is the same, but the quality is different. One of them is a, the other one is a. On the other hand, they might have the same vowel quality, but differ in that one was said on a higher pitch or one of them was spoken more loudly for example um, in a word like bad we have the vowel a and also we have bad and the vowel is a one is a the other one is a. Ah. Here, the quality of the two sounds are similar. Both of them are like each other. Both of them are a. Ah. But one of them is louder. Now, um, what about sound? What is the sound? Sound consists of small variations in air pressure that occur very rapidly one after another. These variations are caused by actions of the speaker's vocal organs that are superimposed on the outgoing flow of long air. So actually we make sounds Actually, sounds are noises. Actually, uh, noises are airs or a kind of air pressure that comes out of your lung. And then some kind of change is done by your vocal organs, for example, your lips or your thong. Then the combination of that air pressure and this kind of change causes something like a sound like s, like sh, like p, like k, like g, like ch, like ch. These are called sounds. All of them are um, a kind of air pressure. Variations in air pressure move through the air like the ripples on a pond. 
just like when you for example uh, throw a stone into uh, the water you see the waves yes waves start from the center and they go on and on and on off to the shore when you speak uh, the sounds start from your mouth and then just like the waves of the water they go on and on and they reach the listener's ear when the air variations reach the ear they cause the eardrum to vibrate eardrum is too sensitive to air pressure or air variations this is why you can hear in fact the ears response to sound is to break it down into different frequencies in fact fibers in the auditory nerve are tuned to specific frequencies of the sound these specific frequencies are um, a characteristic of humans ear this is why uh, for example our hearing ability is different from animals ability for example we say that a dog um, a, a dog's ear is very powerful or in fact more sensitive than us we can only hear sounds with enough loudness or we can only um, understand um, other people's voices or uh, speech in fact our ear is made to do this because the frequency of um, human beings speech um, is only good for a uh, human's ear but we cannot for example hear um, the sounds made by some creatures like insects like ants we cannot hear them because here um, the fibers in the auditory nerve are not tuned to that specific frequency related to for example ants so as we said um, when uh, the sounds reach the ear of a listener they cause the eardrum to vibrate a graph of a sound wave is very similar to a graph of the movements of the eardrum here in this figure um, you can see that the variations in air pressure uh, are shown during um the pronunciation of the word father if you pay attention on the upper side of this diagram you can see the word father here um, the ordinate or the vertical axis represents air pressure and the horizontal axis represents time relative to an arbitrary starting point uh, if you pay attention you can see the time six milliseconds you can see uh, this particular word took about 0.6 seconds to say father the duration is 0.6 seconds um, the lower part of the figure shows uh, parts of part of the first vowel in father if you pay attention we just took one part of a in father and we expand it in the lower part of the figure the major peaks in air pressure recur about every 0.01 seconds that is every one hundredth of a second in every one hundredth of a second you can see the major peaks like heartbeat this is because the vocal folds 
were vibrating approximately 100 times a second. In one second, your vocal folds vibrate approximately 100 times and you can understand this vibration here. In fact, each of these peaks are shown by the red arrows. Each of them show one vibration in your vocal folds, producing a kind of pulse of air every hundredth of a second. This part of the diagram shows the air pressure corresponding to four vibrations of the vocal folds. In the upper part of the figure, which shows the waveform for the whole word father, the details of the variations in air pressure are not visible because the time scale is too compressed. This is why we expanded one part of A in the second figure. If you pay attention to the upper figure, the sound F at the beginning of the word father has a low amplitude. That is, it is not very low, so the pressure fluctuation is not much different from zero. Father, if you pay attention, for f, the amplitude is too low in comparison with the following vowel a and the variations in air pressure are smaller and more nearly random if you pay attention they're not random why is that because if you remember we said that f is a voiceless sound the, the reason is that your vocal folds are wide open and they're not vibrating. This is why, like for example in AH, you do not see those peaks because there are no pulses. For the moment, we will simply notice the obvious difference between sounds in which the vocal folds are vibrating and sounds without vocal fold vibration and you can see them uh, clearly in this figure which we call waveform. In order to visualize what the ear hears, we stimulate this process by spectrogram. It is a visual representation of the spectrum of frequencies in a sound. Look at this picture. The one at the bottom is the waveform, just like in the previous slide, and the one above is called spectrogram. The windows are uh, shaded gray in the wave um, in the waveform, but in the spectrogram we have a kind of three-dimensional graph. It shows the time on the horizontal axis, frequency on vertical axis, and amplitude in gray style. Here the parts in gray style represents the amplitude of the sound but if you pay attention to the waveform, the amplitude is the vertical axis. But in the spectrogram, the amplitude is the gray style. And the frequency is the vertical axis. In fact, we uh, turn the waveform and then we put it inside the spectrogram in a, a three-dimensional graph. Um, here is an example of spectrogram of dolphin vocalizations, like shrimps, clicks, and harmonizing 
are visible as inverted versus vertical lines and horizontal uh, saturations respectively. Now we come to uh, the third part of this class, places of articulatory gestures. What are articulators? The articulators are the parts of the vocal track that can be used to produce sounds. Do you remember the picture in which we had the vocal track? It consists of two parts to major parts try to say the word capital and feel the different places in your vocal track say capital and concentrate on the way you move your tongue the way you use your lips the way you use your teeth capital when you want to make the sound k, you use the back of your tongue, huh? capital. When you want to say p, you use both both lips, cap, p, tall. When you want to uh, say t, you use the tip of your tongue. These are different parts of your mouth and your tongue that you use when you want to um, make a sound or when you want to say a word. Now we want to talk about places of articulatory gestures, that is places of your mouth, your tongue that you use in order to say a word. In this picture, uh, you can see parts of upper surface of the vocal track. And in fact, in another slide, I will show you parts of the lower surface of the vocal track. Um, right now, if you pay attention, you can see the upper lip and the upper teeth. These are familiar to you. Just behind the upper teeth is a small thing that you can feel with the tip of your thong. This is called the alveolar ridge. You can also feel that the front part of the roof of the mouth, the front part of the roof of the mouth is formed by a bony structure. This is the heart palate. If you go further, you have to use um, a fingertip to uh, feel it. In fact, most people cannot curl the tongue up far enough to touch the soft palate or vellum. So if you go further, you can reach soft palate or vellum at the back of the mouth. The soft palate is a muscular flap that can be raised to press against the back wall of the pharynx and shut off the nasal tract, preventing air from going out through the nose. Through the nose. In this case, um, we say that there is a velic closure. I will explain it in the other slide. Now, at the Lower end of the soft palate is a small thing hanging down that is known as uvula. So uh, in Farsi, we call it small tongue, something that um, is hanged. And uh, the part of the vocal tract between the uvula and the larynx is the pharynx. The back wall of the pharynx may be considered one of the articulators on the upper surface of the vocal tract. So uh, these are all um, things, parts of the upper surface of the vocal tract. In the production of oral consonants, 
The soft pallet is raised and press the back wall of pharynx and block the nasal tract so the air goes through the mouth or oral tract. If you look at the picture, you can see that uh, on the left we have velic closure and on the right the soft um, palate allows the air to go through the nose. On the left side the soft palate blocks the nasal tract. When the nasal tract is blocked by the soft palate we call it velic closure. That is the vellum closes the passage of the air. This is called velic closure. When we have velic closure, you only make sounds through your mouth. When uh, we don't have velic closure, you can make sounds like mm, mm, ng. You can make these sounds. In this picture, you can see parts of lower surface of the vocal tract. Uh, first is, again, the lip. We have two lips, yes, this is the lower one. Then we have the tip and blade of the tongue. Tip of the tongue and then blade of the tongue. These are the most mobile parts of the tongue tip and blade. Behind the blade is what is technically called the front of the tongue. It is actually the forward part of the body of the tongue and lies underneath the heart palate when the tongue is at rest. Right now your tongue is at rest. When you're silent your tongue is at rest. So uh, this part of the tongue that lies underneath the heart palate when the tongue is at rest, this part is called front of the tongue. The remainder of the body of the tongue may be divided into the center, which is partly beneath the heart palate and partly beneath the soft palate. And the other part is the back, which is completely beneath the soft palate. You can see that. And then uh, we have the root of the tongue, which is opposite the back wall of the pharynx. You cannot uh, look in the mirror and open your mouth and see the root of your tongue. It's not possible because it is opposite the back wall of the pharynx. And at the bottom, uh, you can see the epiglottis. Epiglottis is attached to the lower part of the root of the tongue. So today we talked about um, what happens to airstream when we talk. Next, we differentiate between voiced versus voiceless sounds. Afterwards, um, we identified four main components of the speech mechanism. We also talked about sound waves and what do we hear, how we hear the sounds, what happens in the ear that we hear sounds. We also introduce spectrogram. Then we talked about parts of the upper surface of the vocal tract and also parts of the lower surface of the vocal tract. This is the end of uh, session one. Good luck everybody.